Hi. Formal methods. Even the name can seem intimidating, and sure, you could go really deep with this, but you can also just use them as great tools when designing digital logic hardware on FPGA or ASIC, and what I've found is that they can be really useful not just to verify things, but while you're actually doing the design. This is going to be a crash course intro to how I use Formal during the course of design, and I'll be using highlights of a talk I gave at the awesome Free Silicone Conference in Paris. In the examples, I'm using Amaranth and Python along with Yosis, but really everything I have to say about using these formal verification methods should apply regardless of the HDL or toolkit. So let's start with cover statements. Cover is a cooperative tool in the sense that it'll do everything it can to meet all your conditions and produce a value change dump, a VCD file, that you can look at with GTK Wave, for example, that shows you the state of the system leading up to the final condition cover. So cover is just a way of looking through at a specific path through the state space. If you have a counter and ask, hey, cover the case where count equals 15, then it'll produce traces that tick the clock until the count is 15. When I run this, it goes through and it spits out oh, the trace. Okay, so this is GTK wave. Yeah, we made it to 13, congratulations. So it's a helpful tool, but it's also really lazy. Usually it'll take the most direct route to meet the requirements, which might not always be what you want. Cover me this, give me an instance where recent count uh, goes high. And so this is what it spits out. Oh, you want a reset count high? Here you go, reset count high. Okay, one clock, very boring. And that's the thing that I'm showing with this is that cover will do its very best to give you what you're asking for, but it'll do it with the minimum amount of flare. It'll just, here it is, that's it. So to make this more interesting, I add another condition. I say, okay, give me the reset count high, but also uh, make sure the count is six. And the interesting part about this uh, trace is that I didn't have to say, hey, you got to enable it to make it all the way to six. Cover is great at discovering these implicit uh, conditions, these things that need to happen so that the conditions are met. So that's a, an interesting part about cover. In that second trace, I didn't say anything in my cover statement about holding enable high, and yet cover handled that because that was one of the things required to meet the conditions I'd asked for. You can even get cover to basically solve problems for you. It won't show you every solution, but it will, if it can, show you one solution. That makes cover more useful than simulation under many circumstances. In a simulation, you have to micromanage each little thing to get the result you want. With cover, you just focus on the result and it handles anything that's implicitly required. Cool. Check this out. In the talk, I set up a module to represent the ferryman problem. You can actually get it to solve problems for you. So this is the ferryman problem. Basically, the ferryman has three objects, a cabbage, a goat, and a wolf, and he wants to cross the river. His boat is tiny, so he can only move one. If he leaves the goat with the cabbage, it'll be lunchtime, game over. If he leaves the goat with the wolf, lunchtime, game over. So what I did was I basically implemented this as hardware, a signal for each of the participants, some uh, housekeeping, and then the rules. If the goat is with the wolf but the ferryman isn't around, you're dead. If you move two things at once, you're dead. And being dead means the fail flag goes high. And by specifying only the end state I'm interested in, where everybody's on the other shore without a failure, the system solves the whole problem. So here's my augmented cover statement for that ferryman problem. It's the same. Cabbage, goat, wolf, and ferryman are all on the other side. No failure, but uh, on the for at least one tick before that, the wolf, the goat, and the cabbage were on there too. So the failure will be registered. Uh, and also, I just put another thing. Okay, on the first tick, the ferryman stays on the first shore, just so we can see it. So here's what comes out. An actual solution to the problem. So as we go through, the ferryman brings the goat, comes back for the cabbage, brings the cabbage, brings the goat back, brings the wolf, comes back for the goat. Success. To me, this demonstrates the power of cover over simulation in that you can just focus on the intended result. So though it's lazy, it does what it needs in order to produce those traces. So if you bury the cover behind conditions like uh, if A equals three, uh, if B greater than 10, cover whatever, then the system will do what it can to make A equals three and B greater than 10 to finally reach that state where it can do its job. This lets you tune exactly what state the system is in uh, just using conditionals. So what I'm asking for is show me where the lock was opened and where it started out with a value of 543210, so that's the followed sequence there at tick zero, and the cycle is past 10. So I'm just setting these two things to say these are the conditions I want, and when we look at the trace, uh, here you go, 
uh, we see the, the, the solution that comes out. What I'm uh, trying to point out here is that it didn't take much to say, okay, it started with input 543210, and then it waited, and then it added the keys there, key one and key two, to manage to get it open. So I use cover now a, a whole lot more when I'm trying to inspect what's going on than simulation, because with simulation, I'd have to do all these things individually and make sure that everything kind of matches. So a couple of lines and cover will just show me what I want to see. So yeah, that's it. Cover shows you what you want to see without micromanaging all the inputs. It, if the enable needs to be high, it'll be high. And the same applies to asserts and BMC. So BMC, the other tool that gets a good workout during development is bounded model checking. Bounded model checking. Oh, so this is great once you're, okay, kind of, kind of done. I think I'm ready. Or there's this really critical path that I want to make sure everything is okay. This is more about validating correctness than it is about inspecting how things work. You use assertions to declare everything that must be true. BMC and assertions are more confrontational than cover. Uh, when you run a bounded model check, it does everything it can to find an example where your assertion is not true. If it can do that, it wins and is nice enough to show you exactly how it did so by spitting out a VCD file. Otherwise, it keeps quiet. One way to use this is much like standard unit or continuous testing, where assertions are peppered throughout and the tests are run to ensure no changes were breaking. Another use of bounded model checks that I find really neat during design is sneak path analysis. This is an interactive way to use BMC to probe and fully understand anything that's super critical. If you've got a seat eject switch in your cockpit, you want to know exactly how it can be triggered and be sure it never happens under any unexpected circumstances. This technique lets you get there. Let's look at this, uh, this counter again, but let's assume that count equals zero is something super critical, okay? We really care about count equals zero. It needs to be protected for some reason. Okay, so what I do here is I go, okay, I'm going to assert that count is never zero. <clears throat> I'm just asserting this, it's not true, but this is my starting point. So it's an interactive way of doing this. So I generate it, I run it, of course it fails, yeah, count can be zero. And so we look at the trace, oh, count is zero when we start up. Okay, okay, but this is valid. So I'm gonna protect this statement with an if saying, well, okay, okay, if it isn't the exact first clock cycle, then count can never be zero, and we run it again. And so when we do that, another failure. Okay, okay, why is this? Well, of course, when it hits the max, it loops over to the zero again, but that's what we wanted. So again, I protect this statement saying, okay, okay, well, if the count, the, the last value was not the max value, then count should never be zero. And then we run it again. And, ho oh, ho, it passed. And what that tells us is there's no sneaky way for count to ever become zero without us uh, knowing about it. Every time that that happens, we say, yeah, no, that's a valid condition, and that's the way to do it. So this is a neat way of doing sneak path uh, analysis. Okay, so I just quickly glossed over the examples and didn't even mention the Amaranth Test Bench library I released to make this all powerful and easy. Let me know if you liked this, if it was useful, or there's anything more you'd like to hear about on this front. This was just a crash intro. If you want to see the full talk, that's online, so I'll link to it next to the video. Also, the Free Silicon Conference was terrific, and there are a whole lot of great talks, all available for viewing right now, so I'll link to those as well. I hope this helped to get you going using these sweet tools during your design of FPGA and ASIC projects. Thanks for watching. Cheers.